nowadays with radioactive iodine, this is being developed in uh, Riken and other places where you do the inverse, you scatter uh, radioactive ion beams of electrons. Uh, but uh, gamma rays offer a very competing uh, alternative to study electromagnetic observables. So coming to beryllium-8, this is the partial level scheme of beryllium-8. Beryllium-8, uh, the lowest three uh, states are actually resonances. Uh, the ground state is a very narrow resonance, just 92 kilo electron volts above the alpha-alpha threshold. And uh, a, it has a width of about seven electron volts, very small, very tiny width. The two plus resonance is about three MeV and has a width of about one and a half MeV. The four plus is at 11.4 with a width of three and a half MeV. And this fits very nicely into a rotational band. Okay? Uh, for instance, this is, a, uh, uh, is an example which is quoted in uh, bohr mortensen the text on uh, nuclear uh, structure in volume two. This is one of the first examples when, when uh, Gordon Mortensen talk about rotational nuclei. Uh, Uh, Vivek, you muted. Uh, Vivek, let's see, let's see uh, how we can contact Vivek now. Suddenly we uh, lost yes, him, no? Problem. Yeah. Vivek, uh, let's see, uh, Vivek. He was here. He was here a moment ago, Nico. He's still uh, here. He's just muted. Okay. Uh, wait, uh, am wait, I wait. muted now? Can you hear me? No, no, it's okay. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. fine. Okay. Please okay. continue. Okay, no, I actually tried to get to the laser pointer and that's how this thing got uh, went into some loop. View full screen mode. Okay. Uh, okay. I... Yeah, okay, I was here. So, uh, as I said, only even L's are allowed. And so these uh, phase shifts for the various uh, uh, orbital angular momentum uh, states is given here. You can see the delta zero has a, a phase shift of 180 degrees, uh, very close to zero. This is the lab energy plotted here with the, with the real part of the phase shift. So the 180 degree phase shift for the delta two, it doesn't quite go through 180 degrees phase shift across the resonance. It's about 120 degrees. Similarly for delta four, it's also around uh, 150 degrees or so. Okay. Uh, now, the radiative capture cross-section was calculated for the first time by uh, Langanke and Rolls. Uh, and uh, for the uh, L equal to 4 channel, they calculated the capture cross-section of about 134 nanobars. And uh, using a bright Wigner kind of fit, they found that the uh, corresponding reduced transition probability is about 20 times higher than the uh, Weisskopf estimate. Similarly, they also estimated in the other paper, uh, the uh, VE2 for the two plus to zero plus, and that was about 75 Weisskopf units. Now you can see that, uh, you can guess that this is very large for as uh, light a system as uh, beryllium-8. Uh, again, for the students, you, you know that the VE2 is proportional to the uh, quadrupole moment squared, and therefore, it's proportional to z squared a to the four thirds with r squared and r. Uh, uh, I mean, the q is proportional to z, 
r is zero squared, r squared, sorry, and uh, r itself is proportional to eight to the uh, one third. So you have this eight to the fourth third power. So if you divide out by this scaling factor, then for a typical super deformed nucleus, you have this number as about 0.11, which is to be compared with the B, uh, with number for the Lilium 8 for the 4 to 2 transition of about 0 0.08. And for the 2 to 0 transition, that's about 0.3. So you can see that these are comparable. And in fact, the 2 plus to 0 plus from the cluster model, uh, which was the one used by Langanke and Rolfs in 86, uh, is even higher than that for a super deformed uh, nucleus. However, in spite of all this, the gamma decay branch is very tiny. It's 10 to the minus 7. So it's not an easy measurement to make. Okay, there were also ab initio calculations by the Ar Argonne group, uh, primarily led by Pandari Pante, who passed away now. Uh, now these are led by uh, Bob Viringa. Uh, and this is their paper of 2000, where they actually calculate the ground state and excited states of beryllium 8, but all the way from four helium to beryllium 8, and I think even one or two nuclei higher than that. But since then, I think they've gone on to about carbon 12 or so, uh, because as the nucleus becomes heavier and heavier, it becomes more and more difficult for these ab initio calculations to be done. And they use the so-called variational Monte Carlo as a first approximation, and then use the Green's function Monte Carlo to calculate the excited states and the electromagnetic properties of the excited states. Uh, so you have here the calculations for the relay mate in the center. Uh, this is the, just the VMC calculation. The second one is the GFMC calculations. And finally, you have the uh, actual data. OK, now we come to the electromagnetic transition, uh, which we uh, attempted measuring. Um, and uh, after, after many years, we actually did succeed in making this measurement. And this first measurement uh, was done to a precision of about 35% uh, and was published in 2005. Uh, the alpha cluster model uh, of uh, Langanke and Rolfs and so on, and the ab initio calculations of uh, the Argonne and the Illinois group, they differed by about 20%. Now, with this kind of precision, of course, we couldn't uh, tell which of them was uh, the right one. And so we decided to make a more accurate measurement of the order of at least 10%, if not better. So let me tell you about the method adopted. What was the method? The method was to actually shoot an alpha beam of the, of uh, the right energy, of actually a few energies, on a helium gas target. Then you measure the gamma rays and the alphas from the decay which follows the, uh, the emission of the photon. So the gamma ray gets emitted, then it comes down to the 2 plus resonance, and the 2 plus resonance, of course, almost instantaneously decays into two alphas. However, the two alphas come out at an opening angle, which is smaller than 90 degrees in the lab. So in the lab, as you all know from school days, uh, if you scatter a uh, billiard ball on a equal mass billiard ball of the same size, then you, of course, have uh, scattering, elastic scattering, and they scatter off. If you measure the angle between them, it's, a, it's 90 degrees. Now, because of the gamma ray carries away some energy, the angle is not 90 degrees, but it's become smaller. And in fact, the higher and higher the gamma ray transition energy, the smaller and smaller will be the folding angle. So the idea is to put detectors uh, optimizing uh, this, uh, I mean, the efficiency for this kind of uh, angular opening and measure the gamma rays. I should say that the first time we tried it out, we just tried measuring the uh, alpha particles alone. Uh, because this was a method that was actually used for a search for gamma ray transitions in a carbon plus carbon uh, radiative decay of a molecular resonance by Bob McGrath and company at uh, Stony Brook. I thought it was a very cute idea. We tried it, but then we were stymied by the uh, nitrogen uh, impurity background, which caused a huge background, and therefore it, uh, it ruled out such a measurement looking at only alphas at the right folding angle. So we had to measure the gammas. Okay. So where was this measurement done? This measurement was done at our uh, Pelotron LINAC facility. Uh, this is located at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, a beautiful location at the southern end, southern tip of the uh, island of Bombay. And uh, this is the, uh, the heavy ion facility. It's a vertical machine, uh, 14 MV uh, uh, tandem accelerator. And 
our colleagues also built the superconducting LINAC booster. This is uh, the technology is uh, an old technology lead uh, plated onto copper resonators. And there are four resonators per cavity and there are seven of these modules. So the first uh, you know, part of three modules got installed in 2002, 2007, all the seven modules are in action. Of course, for this experiment, we did not use the superconducting LINAC, but uh, the superconducting LINAC has um, enhanced the possibilities of experiments at uh, the Peloton LINAC facility. So these are some of the pictures, the old Peloton beam line, so-called old Cascade Hall. This is a picture of the four uh, cavities in, uh, grouped in one cryostat. And uh, there are seven such, which means there are 28 such uh, cavities. And the cavity is shown here from the bottom. Uh, these are some of the electronics, the RF electronics, which was made uh, locally. Um, and these are the beam lines in uh, one of the beam halls. So they have two beam halls for the LINAC beams, one having three beam lines, the other having three or four beam lines. Okay, so this experiment, as I said, was done with the Peloton only beam, which was in the old uh, beam hall, in the cascade hall. And the first measurement is kind of summarized in this uh, slide. Uh, on the top left is shown a schematic of the apparatus that was used. Uh, we have a chamber uh, which has, uh, which is shut off from the uh, beam side and the uh, uh, paradigm cup side by two Kapton foils, about one milligram per square centimeter. Kapton has the property that it can endure a lot of radiation damage without breaking. Uh, it's about 50 to 100 times better in that respect as compared to polypropylene or uh, mylar. And so we could use typically one or two particle nanoampere beams of alpha particles, uh, about uh, 20 MeV plus minus about three MeV or so in both these experiments for periods of about 10 days without the foil breaking. And we could uh, pressurize the gas uh, target chamber to about uh, point, in fact, it could go up to one bar, uh, one atmosphere of uh, helium, but we usually ran at about 0.7 to be on the slightly safer side. So you have this uh, uh, entry and exit foils of Kapton. You have a place where you, you can mount uh, solid targets of polypropylene or mylar and so on to calibrate the uh, silicon detectors, the particle detectors, and also to calibrate the gamma ray detectors, which are in this case, in, in both the experiments we used uh, bismuth germinate crystals. And in the first experiment, we used uh, 14 of them, seven on top in a closed pack hexagonal array, uh, and uh, up and uh, below and above the target. And then there is a crucial idea, which is contributed by one of my colleagues, Suresh Kumar, uh, of putting a, uh, a limiter here. And this limiter enabled one to look at only a zone of gas uh, close to the limiter. So this prevented, uh, for instance, uh, elastic scattering from uh, further upstream or downstream from actually reaching the silicon detectors. Uh, the detectors uh, for alpha particles were actually pinned out so about uh, nine uh, millimeter by nine millimeter and uh, about 500 micron thick. And they were arranged like this, uh, so as to give a reasonably good efficiency for catching. So if you caught an alpha here in number two, uh, silicon pinned out number two, you would catch the corresponding alpha at number five. And similarly, one with six, three with four and so on. And this is what the, uh, the view of, uh, the bottom view of the, for instance, the visio array, the close pack germanium, uh, bismuth germanium detectors. So this is a photograph of the uh, how the apparatus looked like. And when you open the flange, this is how the silicon pinned out the array looked like. And there's an arrangement for putting in the foil and there's a limiter and so on. Okay, so the, uh, the result from this experiment was that the, uh, this is kind of summary uh, result where you uh, plotted the sum energy of the alpha one, alpha two versus the gamma ray energy. Then you expected a band uh, which was at uh, 45 degrees uh, and uh, you, the sum energy inversely correlated with the gamma ray energy, but the sum energy should be uh, the beam energy after, of course, accounting for the losses of the alpha beam in the gas uh, and also the final state alpha particles in the gas between the target zone and the silicon detector. So these are the sum spectra on and off resonance. So you can see that there is a peak here. Uh, of course, the counts are not too many. Uh, the counts are just about 30 counts at the peak, 
and if you take the sum total, it's about of the order of about 100 pounds or so. And uh, off resonance, of course, higher at higher energy. We could do this in the first go at only two energy. Okay. So the this is summarized here. The experimental cross section measured on the peak uh, on resonance was about 165 nanobands. Off resonance is about 40 nanobands. And the custom model gave these estimates. So we could, assuming a bright Wigner uh, resonance uh, shape uh, for this resonance, we could extract the partial gamma ray width of about half an electron volt. And the cluster model uh, gave about 0.45. We calculate the BE2 is about 25 uh, E squared per me 4. Uh, the cluster model gave about 22. And Viringa uh, had, in the 2000 paper, had a number of about 18.2. But then he came up with a better calculation. And he was extremely happy that this was 26. He said, ah, it's right on the dot. Of course, remember that the error bar is 8, it's 35 percent. So this, uh, the, uh, the agreement was not uh, really so something to be to shout about. In any case, this was the first observation. And it showed that such a small cross-section could be measured. And we decided to do a better measure. So what did we do in the improved measurement? Uh, the experiment was done at the same place. But this time, we measured four energies across the four plus resonance. We used a similar target, gas jet target. But we had a new chamber, which could accommodate a bigger uh, detector, which was a, sil a double-sided silicon strip detector which had 16 uh, theta segments and uh, 16 phi segments uh, on the other side. And of course, there were actually uh, four, uh, there was a quad uh, division for the theta side, but we actually, because of the, the shortage of electronics, or because we have to simplify things, and also it was not uh, probably that necessary, we shorted the left-hand side uh, theta uh, quadrants, two of them, and similarly on the right-hand side. Uh, the gamma rays were detected now in a bigger array, uh, a 38 detector array, because this was there anyway. We were using it for uh, multiplicity gated giant dipole resonance measurements, particle measurements, and so on. So we measured these uh, gamma rays in a bigger array, so the individual count rates were even lower now. And the most important thing in my view was that we employed a heavy met shield around the Capton windows. Uh, in the earlier experiment, we had just put some stainless steel blocks to try to, you know, it was a last minute uh, uh, attempt to reduce the 4.4 MeV gamma rays which come out when alpha elastically scatters off the kapton, uh, the carbon in the kapton coil. And uh, that was causing actually that huge background that you saw in the earlier two dimensional and one dimensional plots. And so this was a big improvement. Also, we put the limiting aperture, which was somewhat larger, because the detectors were placed a little further away to shield the scattered. So this is the schematic of the, the newer experimental setup. Looks very similar. I mean, there are Capcom uh, windows here and here, but you have this heavy met sheet, which uh, shields the 4.4 uh, MeV gamma rays from the PGO crystals. Uh, also, you see the silicon strip detector here. So the beam comes in from here, enters the Capcom coil. This is the zone that is seen, and uh, there's the silicon strip detector which captures the alpha. So these are pictures of the uh, heavy met shield. Uh, this is the cross section uh, of the BGO array. These are again pictures of the same the BGO array showing the top and bottom uh, array of 19 detectors each. And they are typically an efficiency of about, uh, I think overall the gamma ray peak efficiency was about 25%. If I'm not this, if I remember that. This, uh, so anyway, these are the pictures of the silicon strip detector. Uh, this is a picture of the whole uh, gas target chamber when it was open. Uh, so you have the uh, heavy met shields, the silicon strip detector, and the uh, movable target. You could, you could put about three or four targets here to calibrate the particle and gamma ray detectors. These are some uh, results, uh, just a glimpse of those results. Some spectra, alpha calibration spectra, for instance, these are the elastically scattered alphas from oxygen and carbon, and then the inelastic uh, scattering uh, from uh, carbon and from oxygen, 4.44 MeV, 6.13, and so on, in one of the rings. Similarly, the prompt uh, time spectrum between the double-sided strip detector and one of the BGOs, and that shows about a 10 nanosecond uh, prompt width. And uh, OK, it's not fantastic, but that is good enough for this experiment. Uh, however, in uh, it happens quite often, more probably often than you wish, 
So maybe it was not such good uh, uh, planning, perhaps you might say also, if you want to be. But uh, what happened was Murphy's law operated and the one thing that we thought we were improving on by simplifying the gas manifold, turned out that there was a small leak introduced. And that's why instead of having a very clean spectrum here, you still see some counts here. It looks much cleaner than the 2D spectrum, the E gamma versus the E sum, particle energy sum uh, thing, but you see a very clear uh, band here. But I would have liked if this were not there. This was there because at the last minute we simplified something and as I said, Murphy's law operates and uh, something went wrong and there was this tiny leak and that caused this small background. Uh, so these are the sum energy plots after putting the uh, prompt time windows and of course coarse energy cuts uh, also on the difference energies and so on that uh, these are the four spectra the four beam energies that you could do of course alpha beams act the peloton uh, somewhat difficult to manage because they have to they would have, they change the ion source for that and the ion source was not the simplest of ion sources to use because it involved an rf ion source that is relatively simple but the, there's also a rubidium charge exchange canal, so one or the other could give problems, and that's why we, we perhaps could have got two, three more days of beam time. But uh, this was the, these are the four energies that we could manage. And from this, uh, in order to extract cross sections, you have to do a Monte Carlo simulation. So this Monte Carlo simulation, of course, uh, involves uh, doing the simulation, which includes extended gas target, the aperture, of course, energy loss of the beam and the decay alphas angular distribution effects of the 4 plus 2 plus gamma rays and also the angular distribution of the decay alphas. Uh, then the gamma ray response in the BGO detector. And then of course, finally you generate uh, spectra and you put identical gates on the simulated and actual uh, data in arriving at the repeated capture process. So just to give you a glimpse of some aspects of the simulation, uh, what is shown here is the efficiency in percentage times the range the effective target range near the aperture, uh, which was actually of the order of one to two centimeters, depending on the uh, energy of the particle and also uh, on the pressure and so on. And you can see that we operated at 70 mm distance between the center and the silicon strip detector. So it was uh, not too bad. It's about a thousand percentage millimeter. So if you have, let's say, one centimeter uh, or two centime centimeter effective target, that's like about 50% uh, uh, efficiency for the alphas. Okay. Of course, there is also the gamma ray efficiency that comes in, uh, that is separately put in. Similarly, the effective target zone, as I said, is uh, uh, plotted here. Uh, what is plotted is the efficiency for detection of the two alphas following gamma decay uh, for three beam energies. Uh, so you can see that for the highest beam energy, it actually comes from slightly behind the aperture. And for the higher, uh, the lower beam energy, it comes from the uh, more downstream of the center. Okay, so with the simulation and with the data reduction, then we could actually arrive at a radiative capture cross section at these four energies. So uh, the red uh, dots are the old data, the 2005 data. The present data is shown in black. Uh, for the highest energies, we only have an upper bound because we didn't see anything above background. And so just the upper side of the error bar. And if you do a bright Wigner fit, which is this dashed line, then this is what we did to extract the partial gamma ray width on the resonance. Uh, this was a very simplistic approach, no doubt, but this is what we did for the paper at least, uh, pending a more sophisticated analysis by specialist uh, theoretical people. Uh, and uh, the cluster model uh, plot is of course shown here in thick line, black line. Uh, you can see that this data is uh, consistent with the earlier data, but it has smaller error bars of the order of about, as I said, on peak about 11%. Uh, just one slide, uh, since uh, I'm not uh, somebody who knows uh, anything about these Green's function Monte Carlo calculations, this is just a slide prepared by Viringa and Pasteur uh, to just show what they actually did. And this is also their physical electric paper. Uh, they used the argon B18 potential, they used the three body potential, uh, which is the Levi 7 potential, they used the variational Monte Carlo trial wave functions to get into the GFMC, and then they propagated uh, this in time, imaginary time, in these steps, 0.1 MeV steps, uh, uh, 
and of the energy in the cell. And uh, then at about in the region between 0.08 and 0 0.12, uh, they find that uh, it's reasonably stable and uh, they, they use these values of various observables uh, to compare and experiment. So in this case, it's the BE2. So for instance, the BE2 that Abinicio gives is about 27.2. The cluster model gives 21.6. And the experiment gives 21 so we, uh, with the caveat that we have only done a very simplistic bright wigner resonance. The bright wigner is, of course, reasonably symmetric. Uh, so you have this uh, resonance energy, this uh, width, and this energy of the 2 plus resonance. Uh, so we extract a 0.48 uh, with about 10% error bar. Uh, so this is what was published in uh, the RL paper of 2013. It's a good result. Uh, it was interesting that the uh, cluster model for the 2 plus to 0 plus, incidentally, gives about 40 uh, e squared per 4 compared to the ab initio, which is only 20. So there's a factor of two difference. Whereas between the cluster and the experiment, oh, sorry, the ab initio, this difference is only of the order of about 20% uh, or so. Whereas here it's about a factor of two difference. So it should be much easier to distinguish between this model and that model. Uh, I mean, one expects, of course, that the Abin issue will be better. Uh, but uh, in any case, as an experimentalist, this is something that you can perhaps more easily distinguish by a cruder measurement in the case of the 2 plus 2 plus. Uh, now, at that time, we attributed this difference to, if one is to take this difference seriously, to a possibility that we are not including, uh, you know, uh, the external brevstrolling, so to speak, amplitude interfering with the internal brevstrolling. So this is a criticism uh, pointed out by John Schiffer uh, when I gave a colloquium or seminar in Argonne in uh, I think 2016 or something. And uh, he said that, why don't you do R matrix analysis? Uh, it took uh, quite some time to do that because I'm not uh, somebody who's an expert in this, uh, but uh, my colleague in Saha Institute, Subhinit Roy, found a PhD student, and this is part of her thesis. She did an analysis based on this code uh, R matrix analysis and she could produce this kind of fit. I expect that this is not a unique choice of parameters, but certainly they searched over a large uh, area of parameters or uh, many uh, parameters in the parameter space that they had. They fit the alpha alpha elastic scattering at various angles uh, the, and these phase shifts were L equal to 0, L equal to 2, L equal to 4 and so on uh, using the data given in these references. And they came up with the resonance parameters of interest to this measurement, namely the, uh, uh, the partial gamma ray width for uh, uh, the 4 plus resonance, which gives a BE2 of about 28.4. And it sort of reasonably agrees with the ab initio calculations. But I think uh, the, uh, it still uh, uh, is necessary, in my view, to have a better. So I, in this slide, I summarize uh, the results of this, and then we go to the future possibility. So the results of the more accurate measurement have been given here, but a better theory combining ab initio structure and reaction models is needed. Because as I said, you can have uh, gamma ray emission before it forms the resonance and after, and these two amplitudes can interfere with the uh, on resonance amplitude when these two are very close together. And such a calculation I think is needed. And in fact, Viringa said that he has uh, started, he had done such a calculation for the neutron helium core system, and he would try to do this for the alpha alpha system as well. As I already pointed out, uh, a more challenging measurement uh, needs to be done, uh, namely the gamma ray branch from the two plus to zero plus, and uh, the difference between these two models is very large. However, this is very challenging because the branching ratio is about a hundred times smaller, uh, of the order of hundred times smaller, I should say. And there are two main possibilities, I think. One is to use a gas jet target. Uh, what we used in these two experiments was an extended gas target. So uh, it would be much better to have a gas jet target of the size of, let's say, 2 millimeter or 3 millimeter by 3 millimeter and with a sufficient uh, you know, number of uh, atoms of the order of 10 to the 17, 10 to the 18 per square centimeter. And this could be done very nicely at the Science Institute uh, accelerator, which is getting commissioned presently. We could span the resonance uh, region from 3 to 9 MeV in the lab. And that would be a much cleaner way of doing it. Or, of course, we initially thought of 
also trying to do this with the boron 10 p alpha there is a resonance at 163 kV it can be done in principle with an ion source but it it's fairly challenging because of the large uh, count rate of the 4.4 MeV gamma rays coming about from the uh, capture process itself uh, okay the other challenge of course for such a measurement would be because of the small uh, you know energy of the beryllium zero plus resonance the folding angle gets much smaller than 60 degrees in fact it's about 20 degrees on resonance which means that you're going to be troubled by elastic scattering so in the case of boron you'd be troubled by two or three alphas coincident with the tail of the 4.4 mev uh, gamma rays uh, so perhaps a, you know an array of uh, either over bias silicon detectors or a diamond uh, detector array combined with a lanthanum bromide or a inga array uh, is necessary for such a measurement uh, i point out another possibility very intriguing uh, actually i'm i think not doing too well in time but i I'll, i hope to finish another couple of minutes is to look at the intrastate e2 transition which is related to the diagonal e2 moment of the 4 plus state so consider the possibility that you are slightly above the resonance above the 4 plus resonance and you are looking for a gamma decay to uh, uh, the lower half of the resonance so e uh, resonance plus gamma by 2 to e resonance minus gamma by 2 the expected branching ratio is 10 to the minus 9 100 times smaller than what we measure uh, in principle, the same setup could be used with the gas jet target. Uh, and this is the uh, unique uh, feature that uh, there is probably no observation of an intra resonance electromagnetic transition in uh, leave alone any nuclear system, in any atomic or hydronic system. A single resonance to resonance decay, intra resonance decay. For instance, the delta resonance, we know the delta resonance uh, gamma decays to the nucleon, uh, and that branch has been seen. So the six uh, parts per uh, mil uh, and an intra-resonant branch should be roughly 0.4 mil but this has not been as far as I know again I don't know whether there is some in unpublished data uh, whether this has been measured at all uh, so this is a intriguing thing because it could give you a measure of the quadrupole moment of the four plus resonance uh, something which is quite unique you can't get it any other way and it's the probably the analog uh, in some sense of the uh, Coulomb scattering reorientation effect. Okay. okay, and then of course, finally, uh, you could also look at other possibilities of electromagnetic decay in unbound states, in five lithium, six beryllium, and so on. So, so I, okay, uh, just a few slides. I, I think I'll skip these slides. There is already some work going on at the Science Institute and VECC in Kolkata to make a gas jet target of the order of 10 to the 17 atoms per square centimeter, which I think to begin with, should be adequate for such a measurement. And uh, finally, I come to my acknowledgement. These are my colleagues, uh, Deepak Chakravarti, who's here, I think. Suresh Kumar, I didn't see in the beginning, but maybe he has joined. And uh, many, many other colleagues from uh, BRC, TIFR, from IUAC, Delhi, uh, uh, Pastor and Beringa, Lister from Argonne. Uh, Lister, I think, left that place since. Dave Jenkins, who should be here, I think. I hope it's not too early for him. Uh, Roberts from York. And Subinit and Suprita who did the R matrix calculation. Of course, finally, to the California facility staff. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, are there any questions to the uh, uh, to the talk? Uh, maybe to the speaker. Uh, please unmute and ask the question directly, or I will read it from the chat. Any question? Okay, yes, please. So, uh, please. Ivek, uh, thank you very much yes. for such a beautiful talk. Um, I know this, uh, this story of yours because Dave Jenkins comes here to the taste and, and tell me about this experiment and that experiment. And this was one of those I really was uh, looking forward to hear details. Uh, we did, an, uh, uh, we have a paper on, on beryllium 10. And mm -hmm. We compare different uh, because you are trying to, um, according to John Schiffer, you know, to use the G matrix and, and put it into your, your results. So at the beginning, R you are R matrix, matrix. Sorry, you are matrix yeah. for the reaction um, uh, model. So we are, uh, yeah. you, you have experimentally at the beginning 21 E square Fermi to the four, then that agreed with the cluster model, but then the city, the, the, you use the green function Monte Carlo to compare with 27.2. And with the G matrix, you got 28.4, right? 
which agrees with the Green Function Monte Carlo. So, however, I want yeah. to say one thing. You know, we, yeah. we, we cannot, uh, we have to be very careful when we play this game because, we, as we know, the, the Green Function Monte Carlo used the AV18 potential, the argon potential. Yeah. And this yeah. has a, 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 is missing some of the, of the spin orbit interaction. Whereas the CD bone, obviously, we are, we are the good thing of this, uh, of this nucleus is that we. No, no, they also use the three body interaction. They add the three body interaction for the uh, GFM. doesn't matter. Oh, well. well That's you called the, some Illinois 7 or something body. like that. Okay, you add the three body interaction, then yeah, you yeah. get better, better results and you, you improve for this deficiency yeah. on the but, but the point still is. That the radiative, the in out, outer Bremsstrahlung is not added because you are not mm -hmm. including the reaction part. Okay, Whatever okay. is emitted before and after, in principle, those amplitudes should interfere with the you know uh, by when the resonance is uh, actually right. Uh, formed. But I will, I will, so I will. Uh, I that mean, is I'm, missing. Him. So he promised that he would try to calculate that. I don't know whether he will succeed in doing that, but. Uh, but like, that's do, we, do we need? Do we so need? So the free, agreement free with courses. the R matrix fitting. May only be, you know, should be taken with a pinch of salt, I guess. But what I mean is, do we need three body, three body forces for beryllium eight? Uh, as I said, I think unless we do a complete uh, calculation involving, <coughs> you know, incoming channels and outgoing channels, I think it would be. Uh, I mean, certainly you should include three body forces, but to guess but why, 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 why is that? that? We have we have only two alpha particles, right? Yes. So what, is the, what is the three body force coming into place here? Well, no, no. They start out with the with the nucleon nucleon interaction. So they they have to include the three body interactions also. Yeah. And they you know, they are doing really ab initio. Three, three, three from, yeah, that's right, that's right. It's not there. The, the cluster yeah, model yeah, calculation yeah. was what was used by Rolfs and Langanke. So they treated yeah. alphas like a. Of course, they anti symmetrized and all that, but. I will be, uh, what I want to say is it will be interesting to have a, a calculation from the CD bone just to nucleon forces and see yeah, what okay. the... So if somebody can do that, yeah, that would be nice. I don't know whether Viringa would be willing to do that. But no, somebody yeah, else. Peter, Peter Navratil or, or someone from the Liberal yeah, Group. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, sorry. Okay. Uh, um, may I ask a question uh, asked by uh, Nara Singh. Nara Singh is asking yes. how much... Elastic scattering from uh, Capton uh, one milligram per square centimeter is in silicon uh, in into silicons e is seen. Oh, it's completely blocked because of that uh, limiter. As I said, we have a 24 mm limiter at the center, and so we don't actually the detector is the ID is larger than what you would see from the Capton foil. So <clears throat> that was a that was a very nice idea of Suresh Kumar, one of my uh -huh. colleagues. Yeah, you that's put the limiter, and that limits the you know seen zone to just near the uh, limiter, mm, and so you really, don't actually see the captain foil at all. Uh, that's really great. Uh, I was also yeah. wondering, you know, you are measuring uh, uh, current on Faraday cup, uh, yeah. but but uh, is there any cross check done from any other method like elastic scattering? Uh, well, I mean, uh, at this level, I think uh, we we checked how much is the leakage current and so on. And I think that was less than about, uh, it was between 5 and 10% at most. So we had also runs in which we would measure, when the beam is off completely, we would measure this leakage current uh, at various times. And this was very small. So uh, since we are running between 1 and 2 pico uh, uh, nanoampere, sorry, and the leakage was uh, less than 0 0.1 nanoampere, I think this was a, we are reasonably confident of the current. Okay, thanks very much uh, for the very nice presentation. It was written in this chat that it was spectacular.